Good afternoon, this is Sean Golding with Golding and Golding here on a bit of a refresher course about FBAR filing requirements as we head into 2023 with a focus on who has to file. The FBAR is foreign bank and financial account reporting. It's not an IRS form, even though the IRS is tasked with enforcement. Taxpayers file an electronic FinCEN form 114. FinCEN refers to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, but the majority of the time, if not almost always, it's not a financial crime. It's a civil matter when there's any penalties involved. Taxpayers have to report the FBAR in any year that there's more than $10,000 in annual aggregate total of the accounts. If there's more than $10,000, whether it's one account with $25,000 or I don't know, seven accounts with $1,500 each, it's not about each account being more than $10,000, it's the aggregate total. It involves more than just bank accounts, investment accounts, stock accounts, pensions, your CPFs, your EPFs, your Australian supers, mutual fund and other pooled fund accounts, they're all included in the reporting. It's typically due April 15th, but it's on automatic extension, so people have until October without having to file an extension form such as a 4868 or a 7004. But the most important threshold question is who has to file? Not everybody, but unfortunately it's more people than you might suspect. So let's let's take a look. It's U.S. persons. That's the key phrase, U.S. person. But that does not just mean uh, an individual. It doesn't just mean a U.S. citizen. There's various categories. For individuals, it's typically going to be three different categories. It's U.S. citizens, either by birth or naturalization, lawful permanent residents, aka green card holders, and foreign nationals who meet the substantial presence test. In the latter category, oftentimes it's someone who's here on like an H-1B or L-1, uh, or maybe an EB-5 investor visa, B-1, B-2 tourist visa, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's typically someone who's here on a visa, although it doesn't have to be. And they're here for a sufficient number of days over a three-year period so that they're taxed just as permanent residents and citizens are. Entities. Entities can also be U.S. persons, U.S. corporation, um, LLC, trust, partnership. If they, Let's say there is a corporation and that corporation has some foreign bank accounts, whether to conduct business or they want to maintain local currency to pay vendors, etc., the corporation may still have to file, even though it's not an individual per se. Uh, when you have corporations, you have other ancillary issues too, such as if there's like an employee, for example, who may have um, signature authority over in a foreign account, like a, a financial officer, or just someone who travels there for business a lot, they may have their own individual filing requirement, not as an owner of the account, but as someone who has signature authority. Estates, disregarded entities, they have to file the FBAR too. You got to a corporation who disregarded it or an estate maybe inherited some accounts. The decedent had some accounts overseas. Now the estate has it. They have to file some returns. Well, if there's foreign accounts, they'd have to file the FBAR as well. A few important uh, considerations involving who has to file the FBAR. Territories and possessions, things like Guam, Puerto Rico. If you're a resident there, uh, you still have to file the FBAR. Okay? Accounts located in those countries are not considered foreign accounts because... They're considered to be U.S. possessions and territories. They fall under the umbrella of U.S. person. And you can also read about it a little. I mean, we have a ton of information on our websites, but there's a publication, 5569, the IRS published, I believe it was in March in 2022, that gives some more examples and, and, and um, specifically defines the different territories and possessions. If you are a U.S. person, let's say you go live overseas and you make a treaty election, 8833, to be treated as a foreign person, so that you're filing a 1040 NR instead of a 1040, you still have to file the FBAR. In other words, you're a U.S. person, and just by filing the treaty election or making the treaty election, that doesn't remove the, uh, the responsibility to do so. Um, inversely, or conversely, if you are a non-U.S. person and you make like a 6013 g election or something similar to file a tax return with your U.S. person spouse to file jointly, that in and of itself does not make you a U.S. person for FBAR purposes. So as you could see, just who has to file, it can get complicated. If you're out of compliance for prior years, you know, the IRS has really been enforcing FBAR reporting and filing lately. There's various safe amnesty programs to assist you with if you're willful or you just can't certify under penalty of perjury that you're non-willful. You got the voluntary disclosure program. If you're non-willful, there are a lot more options available. 
You have streamlined procedures, reasonable cause, and delinquency procedures. You know, we got a lot of free information available on our main website and our sub websites. You can always reach out and schedule a reduced fee initial consultation if it's appropriate to your matter, and it's something that we handle here. Again, my name is Sean Golding with Golding and Golding. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day.